Hello, welcome to the second of the Dialogues on Current Boundary Systems organized by the Ocean Observation, Physics and Climate Panel. Just as a reminder about the goals of these dialogues, first is to guide observing system requirements for ocean physics at ocean boundaries to link the global observing system to the regional coastal systems. Second, promote conversations and collaborations between modeling and observing communities towards better observing system designs. And this talk here will be focused on observations. Um, third, derive knowledge from historically well-observed boundary current systems and mature observing systems. And the focus today will be the California current system off the west coast of the US. And my name is Kasha Zava. I work at Marine Robotic Vehicle Systems now, though I'm still an affiliate um, with Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I'm a physical oceanographer. And we are recording this talk here today on the 18th of May. Just as a quick outline of what I'll be discussing today. So first, um, I will provide a quick overview of the California current system. Then I will talk about observing systems in the southern and central CCS, um, focusing on, there are many, many observing systems, but I'll just focus on a couple that I know best. Um, then I will move north to talk about observing systems in the northern California current system, and I will close and with a summary slide that provides some context. All right, so the California current system is a very vast, current system. It spans the west coast of the United States and a bit beyond, so from border to border, but also into, into Canada as well as Mexico. Um, in, in the horizontal, we care about this current system um, because of the meridional heat transport uh, that it causes. So um, we have a convergence of water masses that happens in the mid-latitude CCS. So we have subarctic water that comes down in the California current. That is this, this white arrow here offshore. And then we have tropical water masses that come up along the coast um, in the California undercurrent, which is this dashed line here. Um, so we have very different water masses that are coming together and merging um, off the coast of the US. So that's the horizontal depiction there. In the vertical, we care a lot about this current system and observing it because um, of the vertical upwelling of cold and nutrient-rich waters. Um, so these, this up, these upwelling mechanisms um, that bring the cold water up to the surface help, help maintain our mild coastal weather. I'm here in San Diego right now looking outside. It's gloomy, um, so we, we tend to have pretty mild sort of Mediterranean type of um, weather here and it's largely due to the to the cold water offshore and of course this cold water brings with it nutrients to the surface um, and so we have a very biologically productive um, current system you can see that here this is a satellite image of chlorophyll the green here um, represents high chlorophyll concentrations as i mentioned this current system is very vast border to border and so it's certainly not homogenous um, along the entire coast. And so people have broken it up into, into regions where, where the dynamics um, and some of the physics and the mean and annual cycle um, mechanisms tend to be distinct and different. And so that would be the northern, central, and southern CCS. And those correspond with um, these three regional observing systems, those being NANUS, Senkus and Skus, going from north to south. So I will start in the southern portion of the CCS, um, southern and central. So basically from um, along the coast of California here. So this map here shows a variety of assets um, that that Senkus um, works with off the coast of California. Um, there's a ton of stuff. Off, offshore here, and also um, not shown here are assets that um, Senkus deals with, which kind of occupy this northern region here. So we have all sorts of instrumentation in the water, um, ranging from manual shore stations to automated shore stations. Um, there is regular ship sampling that happens. We have buoys, 
moorings, underwater gliders, HF radar, and um, Senkus does some animal telemetry as well. So I have 20 minutes here, so not enough to not enough time to talk about all of these um, different platforms, but I will just focus on the three that I am most familiar with, um, those being manual shore stations, ship-based sampling, and underwater gliders. Okay, so first, starting with the shore stations, um, there are many of these up and down the coast. Um, today, I'll just focus on the Scripps Pier Temperature Time Series at, at SIO. Um, I believe it's the longest time series. Um, it was established in 1916, over 100 years ago. Today, it is funded by the California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways. The sort of broad science objective um, is to monitor long-term variability in trends. And because the time series now is so long, um, one can also separate natural from anthropogenic changes um, in the coastal zone using a time series like this. Sustainment in this case is daily bottle samples. There's two, one at the surface, one at the bottom. They come up to the pier and then um, the scientists measure temperature and salinity. And this has been fully sustained for over 100 years every single day. There are a variety of data sets and data products that are made available on the website, um, ranging from Excel to CSV files, as well as um, real-time plots, some of which are shown here on the left. Um, users of this data include um, researchers. It's a very valuable data set, again, because of how long it is. Um, also, the public and journalists in San Diego who write about environmental um, variability tend to use this time series because they know about it, it's interesting, um, and the public is aware of it too. It's also a very useful data set for educators um, because it's so accessible. And some of the successes of the time series include, well, its operational success is that it's the longest continuous record of temperature on the Pacific Rim, and scientifically, it's a success because it allows people to estimate um, decadal to centennial temperature trends. And so this plot down here shows what the what the trend in temperature is over a century. It says 1.24 degrees C. Um, so again, able to make an estimate like that um, because of the length of the time series. Okay, moving on. Next, we've got ship-based sampling and the, the main ship-based sampling that happens um, off of Southern California is through the California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigation Program, or CalCoffee. Um, CalCoffee was established in 1949, and today it's funded by the California Department of Fish and Game, as well as NOAA, as well as um, UC, San Diego, Cal UC California San Diego SIO. Um, the science objectives of the program have changed over the years. So when it was founded, um, it was intended to study the ecological aspects of the sardine population collapse that had happened around that time. Um, over the last 50 plus, oh, 70 plus years now, <laughs> um, the objective has evolved into um, sort of a broader study of marine environment off the coast of California, the management of its living resources, and monitoring the indicators of El Nino and climate change. Um, sustainment in this case involves quarterly cruises four times a year um, to measure hydrography and biological data. The map on the left here shows um, where, where the stations are along the historic Cal Coffee lines. Um, this is sort of a subset, sometimes the the, the sampling scheme is bigger and goes a little bit further north. Uh, the data products that are produced include data reports, both quarterly and annually, um, as well as publicly accessible data on their server. The users are predominantly um, fisheries management, um, but it's also used for basic research as well as model validation. I believe the success of the program is that it has been able to resolve decadal scale um, physical and biological variability in the Southern California current system. And this, these data are also used as a standard um, for sensor and regional model validation. So 
if someone is deploying a new sensor on, say, an autonomous platform, it's very common in the region that they compare to historic Cal Coffee data, um, as well as if someone's running a new model, it's often validated with um, historic Cal Coffee data. So it's a very useful data set for validation. Okay, third, we have the California Underwater Glider Network, or CUGN. This was established in 2005 by um, the SIO Instrument Development Group. Um, today, it's funded by NOAA GOMO, as well as SCUS, as well as SENCUS. And the scientific objective here is to monitor the regional effects of climate variability. Um, so there are many basin scale climate signals like El Nino, um, but with this, with this network, the interest is to understand what the coastal regional um, effects of those um, climate phenomena are. So statement in this case is um, repeat um, glider surveys. In this case, it's the spray glider um, sections, or sorry, repeat spray glider sections um, along these lines um, to measure temperature, salinity, as well as velocity. The dive profiles um, cover 500 meters in the vertical, three kilometers in the horizontal, and they take three hours. So that's the, the resolution of the data. Um, the historic lines, um, 90, 80, and 66.7 are have been fully sustained since 2005. Um, line 56.7 came online more recently and is in the process of becoming sustained and as well as the along shore line here and line 93.3 is, is not sustained. That was sort of at the beginning of the program and these observations moved to line 90. There are a variety of data products um, that the CEGN group produces. Um, I'm not gonna go through all these here, but we've got NetCDF files, MAT files, um, et cetera. These data are delivered um, to NOAA, um, the Glider DAC, NAVO, and a variety of other groups. Um, on our website, spraydata.ucsd.edu, um, there are delayed mode QC files, and as well as a climatology that we have calculated, and that is both files and plots. Um, there are a variety of stakeholders, collaborators, and users of this data, ranging from local to state to federal um, level government agencies. And um, these data are also used to assimilate and validate a variety of models from a variety of different groups. The success of the network is that it is operationally the longest sustained glider time series in the world to our knowledge. Um, and it's uh, what we would consider a mature observing system. Um, it's been around for over 15 years. The group does everything from instrument R&D to operations, to data collection, to data processing, to publishing of the scientific data um, for research purposes um, through distributing the data. Um, scientifically, it's been a success in that it has helped resolve um, in high resolution the CCS's annual cycle, as well as the CCS's physical response um, to a variety of recent basin scale climate events in real time. The climate phenomena that we're interested in are El Nino, La Nina events, marine heat waves, as well as some recent salinity extremes. And um, as I mentioned before, it's a very useful data set for integrated modeling observing systems. Um, this data is assimilated into a variety of multiple, or into a variety of regional models. So I just wanted to say a couple words about why why the glider data in particular, I think, is very useful um, for measuring boundary currents. Um, so first, I'll speak to that um, from the perspective of the temporal data resolution um, of, of glider data, comparing it to ship data. Um, in this case, we are looking at Cal Coffee Line 90. Um, so in these two plots, these are Hovmuller plots, we have offshore distance, um, along line 90 on the x-axis, time on the y-axis. The black squares are Cal Coffee ship stations. So you can see those happen four times a year and at discrete locations um, along the line. And then in the blue, we have the glider profiles um, along the same line. Uh, hopefully you can see that there are many more glider profiles than there are ship stations. 
And the right here, we have the same data, but it's collapsed into a single year um, where, where the time is just day of year from January through December. And so in these two plots, which have the same data, the there are 57 glider profiles for every one ship station. Um, and so having that much more data is very useful um, for, for doing science and monitoring. Um, so from an interannual perspective, this again is line 90. I'm showing a time series of the anomaly of potential temperature averaged over the inshore 200 kilometers. Um, there have been a variety of climate phenomena that have occurred in the time series. And the point here is just that with a high resolution data set like that of the CUGN, um, you can monitor sort of the, the start, peak and end of each of these, each of these um, temperature anomalies. Second, you can use these data to calculate or to make high resolution estimates of the annual cycle. Here I'm showing um, time on the X axis and depth on the Y axis. So it's a section um, colored is geostrophic velocity or the color is geostrophic velocity where red is northward, blue is southward. And so something you could see here is this biannual or semi-annual intensification um, of the northward flow, which is actually the semi-annual intensification of the California undercurrent, um, which we've now been able to show in very high resolution in ways that were not possible with just the, the ship data. Um, you can also see here the upwelling of the isopycnals in the spring, the increased stratification in the summer. Um, second, I wanted to speak to the data resolution from a spatial perspective, comparing the glider data to float data. So here we have a map. Um, in red are our float profiles, in blue are glider profiles. Um, there are 11 times as many glider profiles here than float profiles. This is over the same time period in over over this over this um, spatial domain of this map here. And so what this shows is that in the open ocean floats do a really good job of coverage, but in these boundaries, the gliders, um, the gliders fill in that gap. So here we have um, from the floats, they're monitoring the global scale climate variability, where the gliders are monitoring the regional effects of that climate, climate variability um, close to shore. They're able to go up on the shelf um, and fill the gaps of where there is no, um, no float data. So well, one way to think about it is that gliders connect the coast to the open ocean. And the, the spatial resolution of that data is incredibly valuable, both just from a scientific perspective and, and knowing what's going on close to shore where the floats can't be, but also for, um, for assimilation into models. Um, so here in these two panels, um, along the lines, in this case, it's arrows. In this case, it's colored circles. I'm showing the glider data and in the background, or in the back of the map, in this case, again, black arrows, in this case, um, red, blue coloring, um, we see the, the, the model data from the California State Estimate, which is produced at um, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography by Bruce Cornell. Um, so when integrated into these models, the, the data help us see what the mean circulation patterns are, especially close to the shore. Um, and they're also very useful, the, the combined use of the model and the data for um, temperature anomaly attribution, um, specifically for calculating heat budgets. And lastly here, I just wanted to say that all of, all of the data sets I had just mentioned are very useful, but um, the combined use of all those observing systems is increasingly more useful. So here's an example of a recent paper from Ren and Rednick where um, they looked at a at the 2017-2019 surface salinity extreme um, from the perspective of Cal Coffee and the California Underwater Glider Network. That's shown here on the on the left side. So the the gliders here in red or I guess down here in red because we're looking at salinity, um, show what the recent anomaly looks like. The Cal Coffee data from the ships shows what the historical context of that anomaly is going back to 1950. And then um, the, the Argo data shows 
the, the broader sort of base and scale context for those anomalies. So using all those three data sets together is incredibly powerful. All right, now we're going to move north um, to look at the, the northernmost regional observing system, which is NANOS. Um, here's a map showing some of the assets that are either funded by, maintained by NANOS or um, contributing partners. So some of the platforms that are funded and maintained by NANOS include HF radar, um, moorings, as well as coastal cruises. There are also platforms um, the data of which is contributed by partners to NANUS. Those include buoys and shore stations, OOI, CDIP buoys. Um, there is a, a glider line um, affiliated with Suncoos um, right here in Northern California uh, at Trinidad Head, and USGS manages river gauges. There are also data that are contributed by Canadian partners. And um, up north here, some specific regions of interest include the Salish, the Salish Sea up here, as well as the Columbia River estuary. So you can see denser, um, denser observations up there. Second, we have the Ocean Observatories Initiative, or OOI. Um, at this site, OOI includes a regional cabled array that's shown here in this white line, and the Coastal Endurance Array, um, which is an array of gliders that fly um, across shore and along shore, shown here as well as here. Um, that Coastal Endurance Array was established in 2014. So the platforms associated with OOI include a cabled seabed, buoys, profiler moorings, and gliders. Um, there's a variety of sensors, um, including physical, ones that measure physical, geophysical, chemical, and biological parameters. The data is made accessible through the OOI data portal. Um, it's also distributed um, to a variety of other partners and um, organizations and agencies. And they also provide cruise data um, to validate the time series. OK, and with that, I will I will close with this summary slide. So, these are some of the themes that these dialogues are meant to discuss. I'm not going to read, read all these to you, but our hope is that um, this slide can be a reference or a starting point for some of the discussions um, that are going to follow these talks. Oh, and lastly, I just wanted to um, thank you for listening and remind you all that there will be a discussion on the 8th of June at 1500 UTC um, to discuss some of these themes and beyond, and I encourage those of you who are watching to attend. Thank you.